hello everyone. Uh, we are extremely excited to have uh, Professor Chang Tai Xie uh, as the speaker of this uh, masterclass uh, series organized by a FBER. Uh, professor Xie is uh, uh, Phyllis Irvin uh, Rinkoret, Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago, uh, Booth, Economic, uh, Booth School of Business. As we all know, he's a leading scholar uh, in growth and development. Professor Xie published many influential papers, including, you know, misallocation of manufacturing TFP in China, India, which is uh, a cornerstone of the recent huge and yet fast growing literature, misallocation literature. This is also the theme of uh, uh, today's presentation. Uh, we're gonna uh, have kind of seminar style uh, lecture. So if you have questions, uh, do please uh, put your questions into the chat. Uh, if they're short, uh, I will just read them uh, uh, to Professor Xie. And if this long, I will just say, uh, mute you and let you uh, talk directly to Professor uh, Xie. Um, and uh, I also would like to uh, take this uh, opportunity to uh, thank uh, uh, OUE on behalf of uh, uh, ABFER for sponsoring this uh, wonderful master class series. So without their generous uh, support, uh, this activity would not happen. So without further ado, let's uh, welcome uh, Professor Xie. Uh, Chang Tai, please. So uh, thank you very much. So let me start, and I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time um, just just talking about some just just some basic ideas because I think that getting these ideas clear is 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 Im Im important. So the basic question is what is aggregate TFP? Okay, and it's basically and this is something that we know well that it's that it's 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 composed of two things that it's composed it, it's a weight average of the productivity of the individual firms. Uh, that's typically the way that we think about aggregate TFP. But the other thing, which once you say it, it's obvious that, that TFP at the aggregate level is not just the, the TFP of the individual firms, uh, but it's also, it's also a measure of the extent to which resources are well or they're not allocated well between the firms in the economy. Okay. And it's the second thing that I, wanna, I want to, uh, I want to uh, hone in on. So the roadmap that I'm gonna, uh, so this is a, a roadmap of what, what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna first spend some time on how do you measure this thing? You know, how do you measure the extent of uh, allocative uh, efficiency? And I'll give you just three examples after I've laid out the basic framework. First, I, I would just, uh, just, just talk a little bit about some work that I, that, that I did with, uh, with Michael a few years ago on, on the privatization of Chinese and owned firms, and just to show you how these metrics show up in, uh, when you look at, you know, what what was it that happened to the to uh, uh, state-owned firms in China after they were privatized? The second example that I want to work I want to work through is uh, just using the same ideas to to look at the debate over uh, what were the what are the fundamental sources of of uh, informality. The third example I, I want to give to you is, is the specific case of, of, of uh, contract labor in uh, India. Then the last two things I want to show you is how you can take this idea and move it beyond firms. Okay, That is, you can take this idea and you don't just have to think about firms. Um, like in the case about Singapore that I just gave you, it's not about firms firms per se, right? It's about how workers are allocated within a firm. Uh, are, are, uh, 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 some workers have too many foreign workers and other uh, firms have, uh, have too little. Um, the two examples I want to show you how you can take these ideas and apply it to lots of different contexts. I want to talk about the idea of spatial misallocation. And the second idea I want to talk about is the idea of, a, of a occupational misallocation. And, and the purpose here is just to show you how you, you can take exactly the same framework and you, with just a little bit of relabeling, you can, uh, you, you can apply these same ideas in different, uh, in contexts that may seem to be quite different. Okay, uh, so that's the, the, the roadmap. So the first thing 
I want to say is let's go back to basics, okay? And the question here is how do you measure the productivity of firms that are heterogeneous? Okay, it's a basic question. It's a really basic question. And there are literally thousands and, th and thousands of papers that, that try to do this. And the typical setup is the following, that we basically write down the production the function where the output or the revenues of the firm is given by a firm TFP and by some index of the factor of the inputs used by the firm. And the typical setup is that we write down, we, we specify a, a Cobb Douglas production uh, function where, uh, t where uh, output is a function of firm TFP and it's a Cobb the Douglas function of K, the capital used by the firm and labor used by, by the firm. And what most of the literature is focused on is to measure the elasticity of capital and the elasticity of of labor, that is, in terms of this product, in terms of this pro, in terms of this production for function, it's about measuring alpha. There are literally thousands of pa papers to try to fo fo uh, focus on trying to me uh, uh, measuring alpha. What I want to just the point I want to make here is that the the papers that are focused on measuring alpha, it. Um, these papers, in my view, they, they really are focused on a third order problem. That is, it's really not that important. There is because, they, because there is a deeper problem. Okay, There is a deeper problem that one has to deal with if you want to measure the productivity of heterogeneous firms uh, 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 properly. And the deeper problem is that that basic setup that, that many people use, that it's like the first thing that people use, that basic setup is fundamentally inconsistent with the fact that there, you do see in the data heterogeneous firms. Like, you know, so the basic piece of data that you're trying to use, that basic, that, that setup that you're writing is fundamentally inconsistent with what you're observing in the world. And to make that crystal clear, let me, uh, uh, let me assume away the problem of measuring the elasticities, okay? Let, 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 let me assume that the underlying production function is just y is equal to a times l. That is, let me assume that I know that that the elasticity of labor is one and the elasticity of capital is zero, okay? So, so, so that is, suppose that I tell you, suppose that you know exactly what alpha and one minus alpha is. There is a deeper problem. And the, the deeper problem is the following. Just look at that, look at that production function and just ask yourself, what's the marginal product of labor of the firm? And it's, 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 it's trivial. The marginal product of labor of the firm is eight. Right now, think about that and, and ask yourself: Okay, if that's the case, how can you have had how can you have heterogeneous firms? By which I mean, by which we mean, we observe firms that differ in terms of their A. Right? Some firms have high A, and other firms have low A, and that's what we are trying to estimate. And we think that we need to measure alpha properly in order to measure A as the uh, to, to measure A as the residual. Suppose that we do that and we, we observe a firm with high A, we observe a firm with we observe a firm with low A. Well, what th what what this is saying is that well, there's a there's a basic problem with, with that, because if that's the case, right, if the marginal product is equal to your TFP. Right, then there are going to be firms where the marginal product is high, and there are going to be firms where the marginal product is low. And the point is that to realize that that cannot be an equilibrium. And the reason it can't be an equilibrium is because the marginal product is always going to be higher at the firm with a high TFP. And if the marginal product is higher, then the firm with a high TFP is going to get all is going to get all the resources. Okay, they're, they're going to get all the, the, the resources. So the equilibrium suggests that what, what, what basic economic theory tells us is that with this setup, the equilibrium that you're going to see is a degenerate equilibrium where the highest TFP firm is the only one that is going to exist because they get all the resources and everybody else is going to disappear. Okay. Now, obviously, that sounds a little bit ridiculous because that's not what we see. Okay, that that's that, that that's not what that's not what we see. And then, but the point is, is that you know, 
I, I want to just, just try to convince you that this is just not a small theoretical problem, that it really is a major problem, that it, it's a major problem that you have to take seriously if, you, if you're going to do your, if you're going to do your measurement properly. Okay. And first, just let me just show, just, just, just re, uh, write down a few lines to just show you that this, this basic point is also, it's, it's, it's there with a more general function. That is, if you go back to the standard setup where, where uh, output is a Cobb to Douglas function of capital and labor, you can just, you get the following expression for the, the, the marginal product of labor is going to be proportional to firm TFP and to the capital to labor ratio, the marginal product of capital is going to be the same. It's going to be proportional to TFP and inversely proportional to the capital to labor ratio. You take these two equations and you can solve for the capital to labor ratio as a function of, of the wage to to uh, to to uh, rental ratio, which is the same for all firms, you plug that back in and you get the same thing, which is that the marginal product of labor is going to be the highest in the highest in the high TFP firm. The marginal product of, of capital is the highest in the highest in the highest TFP firm. So you so that that is you don't solve this problem by just rewriting a more general function. And basically, what's going on is that as long as you're writing down a constant re, uh, it's what, what's going on is that it's the assumption of constant rate turns to scale, right? And when you have constant rate turns to scale, then the you're going to end up with a degenerate equilibrium where it's the highest TFP firm that dominates. Okay, so hopefully can I've I, convinced you that can I, that, can I that you've got to drop this. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I, 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 but you know, there are a lot of models say along the lines of Burdett Mortensen with frictional labor market, where firms with, uh, you know, uh, with even the same productivity can end up uh, with different firm size, right? So, um, so I, I guess it's not just the constant return scale, but also the competitive uh, market assumption, frictionless yes, competitive so, market yes, assumption, no, jointly no, are giving the results. Absolutely. So that's where I'm going to next, right? I'm going to next. Okay. So then the answer, uh, the, 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 so the way to solve this problem, it should be obvious. That is, you need to have some source of diminishing returns, okay? Something that is going to prevent the highest TAP firm from taking over the market. One way to do it, as one way to do it is, is what was just, uh, uh, you can have some friction somewhere. You can have a friction in the labor market. You can have a friction in the. You can have a friction in the labor market. Uh, you, you can have a friction inside the firm. You can have a friction on. You can have a friction on on the uh, on the uh, output market. That is, you've got to have some friction somewhere, okay. And and then once you have that, then you can explain the equilibrium that you see. Okay, but what I want to say, I, I just want, want to just spell this out and just say, okay, once you have a friction, okay, that may seem it so so that that's the first point. That is, you've got to have some friction. Uh, uh, you've got got to have some friction somewhere, right? And then, but the second point is that once you build in this friction, okay, then what does that imply for how to interpret the data that you are seeing? Okay, so the, let me just show you two ways of doing this. Two, two, two of the simplest ways of, 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 of doing this. One way of the, doing this is to build up a friction that is internal to the firm. Typically, I think that what a macro, uh, a macro economist called this the Lucas span of control model. Um, it's very, it's, and, and, and uh, a very simple way to do this is just to write down a function where output is a function of TFP, it's a function of the resources of the firm, but not with an elasticity of one, but with an elasticity here, I'm writing it down as gamma, where gamma is a number that is less than one, okay? Okay, so that's, uh, that, that's one, so then 
what that does then is that <laughs> is that it makes the marginal cost in this case the marginal cost of labor rise with the size with, with the size of the firm, with the size of the firm that's similar to the idea of frictional labor markets that that was just uh, that was just uh, suggested that is and the basic notion of equilibrium here is that yeah if you're a high TFP firm your marginal product is going to be higher and when you what and and because your marginal product of labor is higher, you're going to want to expand. You're going to want to hire more. And what happens in this model is that your marginal cost rises as you hire more, uh, as, uh, 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 as you hire more and more. Or you can have a model of a frictional labor market that is, it becomes harder and harder to find more, uh, to find people for your company. Or, or to, to just think about it, if you know, if the National University of Singapore wants to expand its business school from 300 faculty members to 3,000 faculty members, it's going to face the same problem, right? It, it's it's going to it's going to face the same problem. So then, what does that do then, right? So in this case, the marginal product of labor is just going to be proportional to the TFP of the firm. And it's gonna and it's gonna be inversely pop, it's gonna be inversely proportional to the to to the amount of resources that it it uses. So now the marginal product of labor is is going to change with scale. Okay, it's gonna be higher conditional on L on on your size. High TFE firms have a higher marginal product of labor. Okay, um, but the marginal product of labor also changes with your scale. If uh, so, another way of saying that is a conditional on TFP. If you're small, your marginal product of labor is high. Think about, say, you know, that's one way to think about a startup uh, that it, that could be a high TFP firm, but it's still a small firm, so the marginal product is high. But what happens then is that hopefully that company should grow, uh, should grow. And what happens to the marginal product is that is that as the company grows, the marginal product falls. Okay, and the equilibrium concept here is that the marginal product is that well in the e, in the equilibrium, if, if factor markets work, marginal products are going to be equated to the factor cost, which here I'm writing down as W. Okay, and then you can just in the marginal products. It are equal is equal to the wage is equal to the cost of labor. Then, if you look at that expression for the mar for the marginal product, then you immediately get the expression that the scale of the firm is going to be is going to be a function of a, and it, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a function of a. It's going to be inversely related to the factor cost with an elasticity that depends on gap. Okay, so the first point here is, is that with this setup, okay, how does high TFP show up? High T TFP shows up in terms of the scale of the firm. So the answer to the question is, is how do we know which company is a high TFP firm and which company is a low TFP firm? Okay, that expression for L uh, tells us, well, it's really trivial. You, uh, it's, it's, it's really true. You don't have to do any complicated econometric exercises. What this tells you, it's basically just a first order condition, right? What this tells you is that a high TIP firm is just a firm that is large, right? It's, it's a firm where L is large and you can easily show that it also implies that sales are also large. So, so a, a simple way of, of saying this is that you know, how do we know that uh, Apple is a high TFP firm? Well, just because uh, we know that because it makes a lot of money, right? It's large. It has a very large scale, right? That that's how we uh, that, that that that's how we know it. What about uh, output per worker, okay, or revenue per worker? So that's typically our measure of productivity of the firm. Well, you can see here that. Output per worker, if you just solve this out, if you just write it out, it's basically A divided by L raised to the one minus gamma. And if you look at, so then that's the intuitive notion that we have, that is, if you stare at that expression, right? It looks like what, what it's telling us is that if Apple is a very productive firm, where if it's a company where TFP is high, then output per worker has to be high. And that's the intuition that a lot of researchers have in their head. But what they're, but what we're not thinking about is that there's also a denominator there, 
there's L, right? L to the one minus gamma, which is an endogenous object, right? And it's endogenous in a particular way. That is, is it, it's endogenous that L is going to be large when TFP is high and L is going to be small when, T, T, when T, TFP is low. And you can solve for, for it. If you then, if you solve for L to the one minus gamma, if you look at that expression to the right of, of the optimal employment of labor, that's the first order condition, what you're going to see if you just plug that expression in, what you're going to find is that output per worker is just, is just going to be a function of the wage. It's not going to be a function of the TFP of the firm. Okay. So what's going on? So let, let me just summarize what this is saying, right? That what this, what this is saying is that once you have, so it's basically two things. Once you have diminishing returns, okay. Once you have the, well, uh, once you have uh, diminishing returns, and you assume the marginal products are equalized across firms and equal to the wage. If, if you're talking about the cost of labor, okay? You get two, I think, two results that, that I think are pretty obvious, but it, but, but uh, takes some time to digest, okay? The first point that should be pretty obvious is that high TFP firms are just large. That should be a pretty, that should be an intuitive concept, okay? The second result that you get is that high TFP firms do not, you don't see, you shouldn't be seeing, they shouldn't have a higher output per work. The, the, the output per worker should be exactly the same as that of everybody else. And what's the mechanism that's driving that? It's, 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 it's basically the idea that, Everybody is equating the marginal product to the wage, okay? And the mechanism that is driving that is changes in scale, okay? Uh, so, the, uh, uh, so then, but what this is saying is that this is the, the Y over L is the metric that we all, we all use as measuring the TFP of the firm. And what this basic result is telling you is, is that it has nothing to do with the TFP of the firm, nothing. Okay, you're not measuring the TFP of the firm, you're measuring something else complete. That is, if you want to measure the TFP of the firm, you should just look at scale. Okay, so that, that's what the, the, that, that's what the, this thing is, is saying. And let, let me just show you another way of doing it, and it gives you exactly the same re, uh, uh, it gives you exactly the same result. That is another way in which you could do this. If, if, you, if you like the idea of a constant return to scale production function, you can have it. So but then you need some other source of diminishing returns. So this way of doing it, if you want to assume constant returns of scale at the firm level, um, so Y is equal to A times L, and then suppose that the diminishing returns comes from from uh, comes from the product market. That is what as uh, that is you are producing a product that is slightly different from what from from what other companies are from what other companies are making and as you make more and more of the product the price that you that you get for that product falls okay so what is this this is just a standard c yes okay so this is a really simple way of 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 uh, a, a standard way of doing it. So what you get here is that you get the standard result that the price, the profit maximum price is the markup over the margin of cost of the firm, where the margin of cost is gonna be a function of the wage and it's gonna be, be a function of the TFP, uh, uh, it's gonna be a function of the, the, the uh, TFP of the firm. So, so the first expression is, is a very standard result. Then you can ask a question, okay, what's the value of the marginal product of labor? The marginal product labor, I've just shown you, it's it's A, right? Because we, we we've gone back to the uh, to the to the linear production function. You take the product, the price with the marginal product of labor, the A's, the TFP term cancels out, and then what you get is that the value of the marginal product of labor is just a function of the markup, the markup parameter sigma, and a function of the wage. And as long as the markup is the same across all firms and the wage the same across all firms and the value of the marginal product of labor is the same, uh, is the same uh, across all firms. And you take that result and you ask yourself in, in this setup, what is P 
times y divided by l, that is revenue per worker, you get the result that the revenue per worker is just going to be the is just going to be proportional uh, to the value, of the marginal product of labor, which is just going to be proportional to the wage. So it's exactly the same. You get back to exactly the same result. That is, so it doesn't really matter how you do it. Uh, it it doesn't it. You can have diminishing returns on the supply side, which is the previous model. You can have diminishing returns on the on the demand side. The point here is that it is that uh, is is that uh, what you think of as TFP is not that, right? It's, it is uh, it's, uh, uh, something else. So the, let me just summarize, okay? That what does an efficient equilibrium uh, look like? And, and I, I just want, want to stress that, um, you know, there's nothing special about this, right? The, 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 this is just uh, intermediate micro, right? It's just intermediate, micro. that is, the efficient equilibrium is that revenue per worker is the same across all firms. That's what an efficient equilibrium is. So um, you can also ask, well, uh, uh, well, then when I look at the data, that's not true. Uh, I, I, that's not what I see, and that uh, I would say that's a great question. And that's that's and if you if you uh, hold off for a minute, I'll get to that point because that's going to be crucial in what comes next. Okay, but an efficient equilibrium is one which revenue per worker is the same all across, uh, uh, across all firms. Differences in TFP shows up in terms of differences in firm size. And the corollary of these last two points is that differences that you observe in revenue per worker, do they're not differences in firm TFP. They're something else. Okay. Let me pause here for a minute to, to make sure that everybody is with me. Okay, so now the question is, okay, I've given you this result that may look, that looks rather extreme, right? That, that looks rather extreme, which is that an efficient, e, I'm telling you that an efficient equilibrium is one in which revenue per worker is the same, is the same for all firms, okay? With any data set, any real world situation that you're looking at, that is not true, okay? So how do we interpret then what we're seeing in the world, okay? How do we interpret the results of thousands of econometric exercises that find large differences in TFP measured in terms of revenues per inputs of the firm. Okay, so that's, you know, these are all well-established facts. Okay, what this is saying, what, what I'm saying here is that this, this, this setup is telling you that what this, what differences in revenue per worker reflect is that they're telling you that there are differences in the marginal product of labor. Okay, that is this thing that you're observing in the data. Okay, this thing that you're measuring as a result of your econometric exercises, what they're telling you is that there are differences in the marginal product of labor. So what could, what could be driving that? Well, let, let me first lead you down one path, one possible interpretation, and then I will pull back and I'll, and I'll talk about different, uh, different possible inter in uh, the different possible interpretations. Let's just use the previous model where we have a linear production function where, and price is a markup over the marginal cost. But now let's make one small change, okay? And let me just motivate this by my example of Singapore, okay? That is, suppose that some companies have access to the EDB and other companies do not have access to the uh, they do not have access to the e they don't have a, 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 they don't have a, 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 have access to the edb okay what's a, a simple way of trying to measure that of trying of, of, of writing this down is to say that some companies the non edb companies they're facing effectively a higher cost of labor okay a company that wants to hire a skilled foreign scientist but that you know, when they knock on the doors of the EDB, the EDB that doesn't pay attention to them, well, they have to go through the formal channels 
and they have to pay whatever it costs and go through the 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 uh, formal rules. And the company that's run by the the people that I was having dinner with, they get they get these special deals from the economic development board. So they don't have to, you know, go through the normal market route. Okay. So so. The way I'm going to summarize this is that suppose I say that some company pay just the wage, okay? Those are, those are the companies or the people I had dinner with. And other companies, the non-EDB companies, they it's not just the wage, but they also have to go through these extra uh, hoops. So the cost that they face is W times one plus tau, okay? So think about tau as it's being a, a summary measure of all the of the effective costs they have to pay to 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 get the skilled foreigner that they need in order to get in order to get their company to run. Okay, so what do you get then? Well, price is a markup over the marginal cost, except now the marginal cost is the wage times one times uh, the wage times one plus tau uh, divided by the TFP of uh, by the the TFP of the firm. And output per worker then is just going to be given by W times one plus tau. Okay, so now you can see that some for, if some firms face a high tau and other firms don't, well, that is going to generate. That's one thing that could generate differences in the in the observed output per worker of the firm. Okay. But think a little bit, but, but, but I want you to realize how to interpret this, okay? So if, if this is the way that you want to think about the world, right? You observe a firm where the TFP is high and another firm where the TFP is low. What does that tell you, okay? What this says is that if you see a firm with a high TFP, that means that this firm faces a high tax. If you see a firm with the TFP is low, that's a firm with a zero tau. Okay, what does that mean then? If you see a firm with a high with with a high TFP, that's telling you that the margin of product of labor is high. Okay, they're face, they're facing a very high cost. That is, this these are the companies that are getting screwed by the system. These are the non EDB firms. Okay, that is the company, the firm is smaller than what it ideally would like to, than what it ideally would like to be. Okay, and the low TFP firm, that's a uh, that's a firm where the marginal product is. Uh, there's a typo there. Marginal product is low. Okay, the marginal pro product is low, so the firm then is larger than the far. The, the firm is then larger than uh, is larger than uh, optimal. Okay. And this logic survives in a more general setup. So let's just go back to the Kopf Douglas production function, where you have capital, you have labor with an elasticity of alpha one my or one my one minus uh, alpha. And now, since you, we have two uh, two resources, there are differences in the cost of labor, and there are differences in the cost of capital across firms, which I'm going to represent as tau L and tau K. Okay, so what you get, you can easily show the following result. That is the value, the marginal product of labor. Okay, P times Y divided by L, that's just gonna be, po that's gonna be proportional to tau L. And the value, the marginal product of capital, okay, or the average product, which is just gonna, it's gonna be proportional to the average product of capital, that's gonna be proportional to tau K, okay? And then what you can do is that you can you can take the you can take the weight average of these two things. If you take the weight average of the marginal product of capital and the weight and the marginal product of labor, right? And you get the term, which is basically revenues of the firm divided by k to the alpha, l to the one minus alpha. What is that? That's just what we call TFP, right? It's it's revenues of the firm divided by an index of all the resources that, that the firm is going to use. And what we're saying is that you can easily show that that's just going to be the, what, what that's, that's going to, uh, that that's just going to be a weight average of tau K and of tau L. Okay. So, so in a more general setup, what this, what I'm saying is that what we're measuring as firm TFP, 
Okay, it's just a weight average of the marginal product of capital and the weight and the marginal product of labor. Okay, and in if, and if you want to give that fact an equilibrium interpretation, what this means is that the high TFP firms are the ones that are the equivalent to the non-EDB firms. These are the firms that are being screwed, okay, or that don't get the same kind of benefits that the uh, other firms get. Um, I hope the Singaporean government is not great, is the, the doesn't get hold of this. <laughs> For purposes of illustration <laughs> only. Uh, um, and, and again, I just want to emphasize the point that that the, this this thing that we call TFP, okay, is not TFP, right? It, it's it's not TFP because again, TFP shows up in scale. It doesn't it it doesn't it doesn't show up in terms of of uh, it doesn't show up in equilibrium, right? Uh, in in, uh, in in this in this uh, ratio. Okay, so let, let, let me just say that this is obviously a rather extreme result, okay? What else could be go going on? Well, a bunch of things could be go going on. It could, you, it could be the case that you could have markups differ, uh, you could have markups that differ across firms, okay? Firms have different, have, have different amounts of market power. That will show up in terms of differences in uh, TFP, okay? But again, I want to say that if that's the case, what, what you're observing, what you're measuring as, as firm TFP is the markup. There are differences in the markup. They're not differences in TFP, okay? You could have fixed costs. That's something else that will also, uh, that, that is a, a, another way of saying this is that the first order conditions apply to the variable inputs used by the firm, but if what you're observing in the data are the inputs in, in, uh, the, are the inputs inclusive of the fixed cost, then there's no reason for that to be e. There's no reason for that term to be e equalized. Okay, so if that's the case, then then you want to basically measure well how much is is the fixed uh, what 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 you could be. What what you could be uh, what what you could be uh, observing is just that some firms are paying fixed costs and other firms are not paying are not paying fixed costs. For example, uh, I, it, uh, you know there's a well established fact um, in most countries around the world that exporting firms have higher TFP. Again, you want to be clear: have higher measured TFP. That doesn't mean that they have a higher TFP. They have higher measured TFP relative to non-exporting firms. Like this is a, uh, like, you know, this, so this is this is the basic fact of the world. Okay. Now, now think about how you can generate that fact. One way you can generate that fact is that it's just if if if. Uh, if, if uh, some firms are paying fixed costs and other firms are not paying fixed costs, okay? And that fact is, is, will generate uh, these, the, uh, that will, will generate the, uh, uh, the uh, differences in measure TFP of exporting firms versus non-exporting uh, non firms. It's, it's, now, I wanted to say there that it's an empirical question on how, on whether the, the magnitude of the TFP gap that you observe that is, is, is that something that, that is plausibly explained by the fixed cost. You know, that's a quantitative question. I, I, the statement I made before is just a qualitative statement, okay? And maybe, may, uh, maybe, maybe not, okay? But there, even there, the, uh, I, we should be clear that the way that people typically interpret the higher measure TFP of exporting firms versus non-exporting firms is that that is evidence that, that, uh, that the more productive firms select into exporting activity uh, and, and the non-less productive firms don't select into exporting activity. What this is saying is that that interpretation is not the correct one, okay? That is, if you want to explain that fact, you have to, you, it has to be based on something like a fixed cost 
or markups. That that that. But it doesn't tell you anything about whether you see the more productive firms, productive in terms of higher A, selecting into a export market, uh, into a export market. Okay. And the last thing is that, is that it, you could also have uh, adjustment costs, right? If you think about the assumption that we made, we assume that the that marginal products are equal to the cost. Well, if they're uh, adjustment costs, then that doesn't necessarily have to be true, right? At any given point in time, it it may be it, it may describe the long run, the long run, uh, the long run steady state equilibrium. Uh, but it doesn't have to to be to, to necessarily be true for uh, for all firms at a given point in time. So that's something that that could also be explaining. For example, if you want to think about, uh, say, you know, one thing that would be useful to do. I I don't know whether it's been done. Is to say calibrate a model with entry and exit, right? So you have firms with entry and exit and firms get shocks and uh, they, they, they get shocks. Um, then what you're observing in a, in a steady state are that, you know, some firms are, are out of e equilibrium and other firms are, are basically uh, have, uh, are, 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 are on their e equilibrium path. So then what you observe in a cross section is basically a composite of the two groups of firms. And then again, qua, uh, it would be useful to calibrate just quantitatively how much that mechanism can explain the dispersion of revenue per worker, the dispersion of TFP that we observe in, in the data. So again, I'm I, here I'm just making a qualitative statement that adjustment costs can do it, uh, can do it, but it's, it's it's a quantitative question of how of of whether it's enough or whether it's it's too little or it's too much. Okay, Chen, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Yeah, so so I was, I was thinking about variable markup. So suppose you have variable markups across firms, and then then we we're looking at the TFER, and so the differences in the TFER is going to pick up both the differences in distortion and also the market powers. So is is there any way? To distinguish those, I mean, I mean, the only way in which you could do it is if you're willing to make a structural assumptions about what is driving the heterogeneity in the markups. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I don't see that how that is any different from the structural assumptions that people that that people who estimate markups. So I guess what I'm saying is, is, that, is that if you're willing to make the same assumptions uh, that are necessary to measure heterogeneity in markups, then you can do it. Um, but without making those assumptions, I, I just don't see related to, to their size. In, in fact, we have a whole literature on this. We have a, a whole li a literature on uh, Gibraltar's law for, for firms. Okay, it could be fixed cost. It could be fixed cost, and then, we, but again, so if you want to, if for those of you who work in international trade, uh, the same thing. You know, you want to be very careful at how you are interpreting differences in TFP. Uh, for those of you who work in IO and you want to estimate my markups, uh, uh, that could be the object that you are you are measuring. But again, you want to be careful that that you're not calling it the TFP of the 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 uh, t the uh, uh, TFP of the firm, and then I want to suggest to you that there's a whole set of uh, I'm going to say institutions in the world that that could that, that would suggest that what that difference in TFP could very well be uh, the results of institutions, and they are also permanent in nature. Okay, so I guess we're running into the first hour. So, uh, uh, Tai, can I, can I yeah. raise, put one more question in? Yeah. When we observe the differences in the TFP, there could be right now on the table uh, possible interpretations of the following kind. One, we are facing adjustment costs, so they are not equalized. Yep. We are facing distortions, so they are not equalized. All these are telling us what 
at the end we could have got if they are all equalized. So we review inefficiency. So far, this is the, the, the kind of thing that we're getting at. What if that there is really estimation error? The gap could be due to estimation error, could it? You mean Systematic the, estimation error. Uh, you, you mean that it's measurement error in the data that's correct, uh, correct. what you're observing is measurement. Yeah, if it's correct. measurement error, then it's, yeah, so that's a full. So there, there are three possible interpretations in the gaps that we observe. Right, right, right. Yeah, so it could be measurement error. That that's a, that's another thing that could be that could be, um, uh, yes. Fair. And then I think this measurement error thing can be quite dramatic, especially when we are in Randall's world that is this equilibrium, because the new world, the way to measure was an effective input differs across firms, and and that one is really measurement error. It's not about that people are being inefficient and so on. So this in incorporating measurement error into our thinking can have important, uh, a, 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 can be an important driver in the way we interpret our results. Yeah, I guess you know, that is a, yeah, I think the measurement error is important. I don't, it, it, it's, it's, it's a problem with everything that we do, though, I mean, it, there's uh, there's measurement error in terms of the revenues of the firm. There's measurement error in terms of the labor inputs of the firm. There's measurement error, and so it's I, it's a general problem, right? Yeah, I know, but but in some environments, the measurement error can be more dramatic. That's that's what I worry about, especially in. Uh, well, I I guess if different class of workers sort themselves into different firms, it itself is an adjustment course. Okay, well, I'll take it back. <laughs> yeah, the other thing which has not been done, right? I uh, that that's a good point. I may follow up on the point. I be meaning uh, it's it's a thought I've had in the back of my head. That is. What if you have a slightly different model? You have a slightly you have a model where basically uh, um, you you have a model where uh, workers are sorting into different in uh, different types of firms. Then what is the concept of marginal product? Then what's the right notion of the marginal product? Then right, and it's a slightly different concept because here the way that we are dealing with it is that we are thinking about laborers as being a homogeneous input, and we can think about this concept of a marginal product, but the if you could have a, a, mod, a setup where, you know, the productivity of an input differs depending on where they are, right? So then how do you want to think about that concept there? And then um, that was the issue that we needed to confront uh, in this thing that I will describe later uh, when, we, uh, when we want to think about the, the misallocation of, of talent. Which yeah, like, is, uh, sorry to take up more air time, but in the current context, I think this may be important. Um, just imagine that we are, I mean, uh, uh, two days ago, we had uh, Steve Davis, I think. We talked about a lot of adjustment, and there are higher educated workers sorting themselves into the sectors that are, that are more able to uh, implement their work virtually. So here we, we, have a, uh, we have a case in point that we are adjusting and then a certain type of workers adjusting into some, some kind of firm. And so if we do not take into account that a worker is not a worker is not a worker across plans and across, uh, across firms, then uh, there is, I, I'm still trying to think through what the implication is if we are not careful about the heterogeneity across capital, uh, physical capital and labor. I mean, I mean, the quick answer to your question is that the concept that you need is something different. Then, I mean, it's what what, what you need is. Um, so, you need to think about. So let's think about here. I'm going to pick on Michael here. I'm going to pick, pick on uh, uh, Michael. So suppose that Michael moves to, I don't know. Fudan, say, um, Michael who moves to Fudan, said you could ask that question, right? You, you, uh, you, you could ask there the question of what's, 
Michael's marginal product at CUHK and what is this marginal product at, uh, at, uh, at uh, 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 Fudan. And it could very well be the case that the difference in his, his marginal product in one place versus the, his marginal product in another place is going to be very different from, say, the person that's at Fudan now and if that person were to move to CUHK, right, uh, to, to UHK. So then that is the thing that you want to measure. Uh, that is, suppose that you ask the question, you could ask the question, uh, suppose that what are what's going to be the consequence, say, if you take everybody from Fudan and you move them to CUHK, okay? I'm, I'm not going to ask Michael what he thinks about that, that <laughs> idea, that idea. But the answer is not going to be the difference in the marginal product in Michael's marginal product at CUHK versus his marginal product at Fudan. And we sort of know that. We, we know that because, you know, he has selected to be at CUHK and the other people have not made that choice, uh, have not made it. So that, that right off the bat tells you something, right? Um, but then for a lot of questions, uh, a, 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 a lot of questions, what you want is exactly this gap that you don't that you don't uh, that you don't uh, observe. And if you give me, I guess it's going to be forty-five minutes, I will show you how you can try to make some progress on that front. But it's it's about trying to measure the, these gaps that you don't that you don't uh, observe, right? The, Sometimes. So that, uh, let's tentatively stop this uh, interesting uh, discussion. Uh, take a break. Uh, uh, we can come back, you know, in uh, six minutes, and in the meantime, we can continue, you know, uh, talking about this uh, fascinating issue. All right. Let me just go on, and let me just just quickly just show you just some basic facts of what we see in the data. So this is from from um, uh, from my my uh, 2008 paper in the QJE, and th this is just a basic fact about the distribution of firm TFP in India, China, and the U.S. And, and again, let's be clear about the interpretation. The way that we're interpreting is that these this is telling you something about the differences in in the marginal products across firms, not about the dispersion in firm TFP. And the basic point here is that there's a wider dispersion in India and China relative to the U.S. But it's also the case that in the U.S. there's a pretty significant dispersion as well, right? So it's not the case that the marginal products are are the same. If you want some numbers to Keep in the back of your head, the 90-10 gap in logs in the U.S. is about two. In China, in 1998, it was about 6.5, and in India, it, it was eight. It was eight. So the so the so there are sizable gaps everywhere, but the gaps are larger in China, in in in, in uh, China and India. And one of the things that we documented is that in the case of China, what you see is that these these gaps uh, uh, fell uh, uh, fell. Uh, over time until about 2007 or two, uh, about 2007 or 2008. Uh, and we don't have the best data after that. So we, we don't really know. I, 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 I don't think we re re really know what happened to this gap after 2007 to 2000, 2008. Let me now use this and let me turn to just very quickly to some work that I've done with Michael in using this to interpret a specific event in China. And it's basically what happened, it's the event is basically what happened to the Chinese settled firm from about 1998 to about 2005 or, or 2007. So this is, uh, the Chinese call this grasp the large, let go of the small, um, and basically what happened, I'll just summarize this, is that basically, you know, tens of thousands of state-owned firms were closed or they were turned over to private ownership. That's the let go of the small part. And then the large state-owned firms were corporatized. That is, they were, were and that's, I won't go into an explanation of what that was, what that was, but it's it's basically strengthening uh, it's it's a combination of strengthening the control of the Communist Party over these companies, and at the same time trying to subject these companies to market forces. 
uh, that may seem like a contradiction, but I, I see that as being one of the the brilliant things that uh, Zhu Rongji did uh, at, at, that, at, at this. Um, I, I almost feel like, you know, this, this like so nostalgic looking at this now, uh, uh, seeing what's been happening in China. This seems like so long ago uh, uh, that, that, that this, that this uh, 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 happened. But let, let me just show you just some basic data. So I, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to show you some basic data on what happened to the state-owned firms. And here, what, what uh, Michael and I did is that we basically uh, group the state-owned firms in the 1998 that were into two groups of firms, into state-owned firms that were corporatized, the, that's the top panel, and into state-owned firms that became privatized by, by uh, 2007. That's the panel that's on the bottom. And then what this is, it's a plot of the of the dist- of, of labor productivity of, of these two groups of firms relative to that of the firms that were uh, to, 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 the, to the firms that are private throughout this entire period. So what I want you to see here is the following, that for both groups of firms, what you see from 1998 to 2007 was that the, the distribution that is shown on the red dash line is shifted to the right relative to the, to the distribution shown in, in the dark blue line, which is the distribution for 1998. So the point here is that there's been convergence in labor productivity of both state-owned firms and also the firms that used to be state-owned and they and that were that were pri and that were uh, prioritized. If you look at the distribution in the 2007, and if you just go down to the X axis, you can see that the, the, the roughly, the mean of that distribution is about one by 2007. That is, another way of saying this is that in 1998, labor productivity of state-owned firms was lower. How much lower? Maybe about 30 percentage points lower than that of the privately owned firms. But by 2007, that gap had basically gone to zero. Okay, so big convergence in labor pro in uh, in in the labor productivity. Okay, of uh, so labor productivity was low. That's a well known fact. Okay, and labor productivity went up. Okay, that's a somewhat well known fact. Okay, so let's stop here for a minute and ask ourselves: How do we want to interpret this fact, okay? So let me first tell you that, tell you the wrong way to interpret this fact is to say that TFP of the state-owned firms increased. That could be true, okay? That, 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 that could very well be true, but that's not what this, this plot is telling you, okay? What this plot tells you is that labor productivity was low and it's gone up, okay? Relative to that of the prior of the, 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 the privately owned firm. So what this is saying, uh, uh, another way of saying this is that in 1998, state-owned firms on average used more labor than what they otherwise would if they were behaving in an optimal way, okay? But that changed by, by 2007. And if you look at the history, we all sort of know what happened, right? That basically, there was a lot. There was a lot of employment in the state-owned firms in which the workers weren't doing very much, and then once you know, once and, and, and then once the political decision was made that in which uh, that basically gave the managers of these firms the ability to behave in a in a profit maximizing way, a lot of these workers left. Okay, and it was about uh, you know I, I don't. I, I, I don't know the numbers, but there were, you know, lots and lots of workers were let go, okay? And you see that in terms of the current, you see that in terms of the convergence of labor prod, uh, in terms of, of the convergence of labor productivity. Let me show you the same plots in terms of the productivity of capital, okay? So the two things to notice is that, yeah, there is also a little bit of a kind there, that the, the distribution of capital productivity also shifted a little bit to the right, okay? But go down to the x-axis, okay? And look at, even in 2007, 
Okay, what they mean was that even in 2007, the capital productivity of state-owned firms and even of the state-owned firms that no longer are state-owned firms is significantly lower than that of the pro than the than, than that of the privately owned firms. Now, what does that mean? So there is a look uh, again. You don't want to make the mistake and, and uh, looking at one figure and saying, "Oh, productivity has gone up." And here, you 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 don't want to make the mistake and say that this is evidence that prod that the TFP has not. This is nothing. It has nothing to say about what's happened to the TFP of, uh, of the firms. All that it's telling you is basically what's happened to the productivity of capital. Okay. Well, what's happened to the productivity of capital? The productivity of capital has converge a little bit, but it's still the case that the productivity of capital, the state-owned firms is significantly lower by, if you look at the, the magnitudes, the magnitude of, the, of these means are huge, okay? Now, if you think yourself, you know, why does this, make, why, what could be going on here, right? So ask yourself the question, if you are a manager of a state-owned firms and you are given, uh, you, you, you now have the power to maximize your profits, okay? Why might, why might you see this as an equilibrium outcome, okay? It, it is the case that both of these things are a misallocation of resources. First one's a misallocation of labor. This is a misallocation of capital. Why might it be the case that you try to get rid of the misallocation of labor, but you don't want to get rid of the misallocation of capital? <laughs> you think about it, it, it seems it seems to us, to Michael and I, to think pretty obvious. That is, you just have to ask the question, who is paying for this? That is, the, mis the misallocation of labor, okay, who paid for that? Well, it was you. The, it, it was your company. You are forced to hire all these workers where the marginal product is low, okay? So once you are told, you know, you can do whatever you want, make this company strong, make this company profitable, you're going to get rid of these guys where the, the marginal product is low because what you're paying them is greater than the marginal product you're getting out of them. Okay, but what about this? Okay, the 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 the, the pro the pro the give of capital. Who's paying the bill for that? Well, not you, right? It's basically Chinese savers that are that 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 are paying that 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 are paying the that that are paying the, the paying the bill for this. So if you are told to maximize your profits, you want to keep as much of this particular misallocation as much as possible because somebody else is paying the bill. You get access to cheap capital that somebody else does not have, 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 have does not have access to cheap capital. So this is the equilibrium that you see, right? They in, in this case, they get rid of one distortion, okay, that they're paying the bill for, and they want to, and they try to keep the other they try to keep the other they try to keep the other the other distortion um, that somebody else is paying the the that somebody else is 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 paying the bill for. Now the third thing, which I, uh, is, you could ask the question. Well, okay, you 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 uh, you you you've been banging the drum and saying that this doesn't tell you what's happened to firm TFP. Well, how would you how how could, could you uh, 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 how could you say, uh, uh, how do you know what is going to happen to firm TFP? Well, what you want to do is that you want to then measure what's happened to the revenues of the firms, okay, after you control for the changes in the marginal products of, of, uh, of these firms, okay? So then the next thing that you can do is that once you have calculated this for, for, uh, for all the firms, right, then you can get the, so let me just, reiterate what, what, what I've said, you can get the following expression. You can get the expression, uh, the second line, which is that the revenues of the firm is going to be uh, proportional to the TFP of the firm okay, with an elasticity that depends on sigma, and it's going to be inversely proportional to the TFP, to the measured TFP of the firm. That is, if your TFP is high, that makes your revenues lower relative uh, conditional on A, Okay, so then the way that 
uh, uh, you would measure the A, how A has changed, is that you basically look at how much or have the revenues of the firm change conditional on changes in the measured TFP of the firm. And then you can aggregate this up, which is if you then the next step that you can do is to basically go to general equilibrium and ask if you aggregate all this up, then you can get the following, I think, a, a pretty nice expression, which is an expression for TFP at the aggregate level. Okay, so think of this as being the sole residual at the level of the aggregate economy. And you can show that it's basically given by this really simple expression, which is a weight average, the geometric average of the of the A's of individual firms. Okay, but the A's of the individual firm is weighed by the inverse of the measured TFP relative to the average TFP. Okay, so that's that's the that's the second term. And then you can show, to, if, if you want to just understand this expression intuitively, you can, if you make a distributional assumption, if you assume that, that uh, A and the marginal products are follow a joint log normal distribution, you can show that the log of aggregate TFP is going to be a function of the log of the average of, of, firm, uh, of the firm A's. And then the last term is what I want you to focus your, your attention on. It's going to be a negative function of the variance of the dispersion of the marginal products, okay? Where the elasticity of that depends on sigma. So it's this is the idea which basically connects this fact that I showed you before, you know, this fact about the the dispersion of TFPR or this fact that's in the table into an into a statement about aggregate productivity. Okay. Um, let me give you, let me see how much time I have half an hour. L let me. Well, more than that. You have uh, uh, 45. 45. I have 45 minutes. Okay, great. Um, But let me uh, show you one more case okay, on, on why it's, this is a useful concept. Um, and it, it's, you, you can use this to apply to the debate. And there's a very large debate about this basic fact, which I'm showing you, which is that when you look at a typical uh, poor country, what you see is that there's a large degree of informality, okay? Many, many small firms, many, many workers that are informal. Let, and let, let me just sh show you some facts from two countries that I happen to have the micro data for. Like in, there are two ways in which you could define informal workers. You could define informal workers as workers that work in the family firm and don't get paid, uh, don't get paid a wage, okay? If you look at the data in India in 1989, that accounted for 72% of all workers. They don't get paid a wage. They work for the family firm, essentially. And in 2005, that number had gone down uh, to 62%. In terms of the establishments, these, these, these uh, infor uh, unpaid workers work in 94% of the establishments and about in 1989 and in 91%. Percent in Mexico, uh, that number is lower. It's a slightly wealthier country. What you see in the case of Mexico is that all these trends for the last 20, 30 years have gone in have gone in the other way. That is the degree of informality, unpaid workers, all measures of in, in, in informality have been rising over time in Mexico. So this is like in, in almost any poor country in the world, this is a basic fact that is that that you see everywhere. And then the question is, and here's just another way of seeing it. This is a plot of the distribution of size of, of, of establishments that are formal and establishments that are informal. And the basic fact is that informal establishments that account for 90% of establishments, like this is a pretty stunning fact in the case of India, the informal establishments that account for about 90% of the establishments um, they on average have three to four uh, workers. So it's the husband, the wife, and the two and the two poor kids that have to work without pay. Uh, that's the typical firm. And then there's been a huge debate about, okay, 
So whenever you look at this informality, look at informality, so there's a widespread view that if we could only get rid of this informality, this would be the key to unlocking uh, the growth of these firms, okay? And there is perhaps the most influential person that that try to that that try to answer this question was this guy who who wrote this fabulous book in 1985. He this is a book called The Other Path. He, so, so he wrote this book about uh, about what was going on in uh, in Lima, uh, Peru. And what he basically did in this book is that he basically documented what it took in order to legally register two small sewing shops in, in Lima. So basically what he did is that he hired two people to do the paperwork to, to basically to legally register these, uh, the, uh, the, these two small, uh, so, uh, small shops. And these two people worked for six hours a day, five days a week. And what this book is, it's almost like this novel where every chapter describes the visit to one office of the government and, and all the bureaucratic steps that, that they would have to go through. And by the time the book finished, the 250 pages later, 300 days had passed. It took 300 days to legally register these two companies. And the cost they had to pay was 32 times the average wage. And they had to go to 30 different agencies of, of the government. So this book has been hugely influential, hugely, hugely influential, because it gave a very simple message. It basically said that, look, you know, these companies don't grow, okay? These are small informal companies. They never grow. They never adopt advanced technologies. They're backwards, you know, they're, they're, they are backwards. And they would be able to grow if they were if they were to become legally and formally registered, then they would be able to participate in the formal sector. And the reason they don't is because of this inefficiency and the bureaucracy of the government, which is blocking them. Okay, so this has led to I, I would say that this is roughly the conventional wisdom, and it's led to a huge number of things. Like for example, this is basically the idea behind the World Bank's doing business project. The World Bank Business Project was was, was basically, uh, and it's it's it was basically a replication of the Hernando de Soto exercise on all the countries of the world. That there they are now thousands of programs that go around trying to register small firms. This is the basic idea behind microfinance as well. And the the idea there is 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 that you know one of the things that these companies don't get is that they don't have access to formal finance. So if you don't have access to formal finance, one way is to innovate and, and basically give them access to credit. There are now lots of programs that also train these managers and they give them, uh, there's also now an explosion of special tax re of uh, uh, special tax regimes. And I just want to be clear on what, it's important to be clear on what exactly the view is like to just put it back to put this this all these policies in the context of the story about Singapore that I started out with. That is to just you know just a slight caricature that in most of the countries of the world there are two worlds. There's the EDB world and there's the non EDB world. The most companies happen to be in the non EDB world, and if we could just bring them over to the EDB world, you know, lower the barriers, hire more officers of the EDB. Like that's not quite, uh, 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 but basically, make that better world, uh, make that better world, uh, make that better world uh, accessible to them. Then these, then that would lead to an explosion of entrepreneurship. Okay. That's the, the idea. And it, now that I've laid out the framework, uh, it should be clear on how you would measure this, right? If, if this is true, these the small companies, they don't have access to resources, okay? The other companies, the equivalent of the EDB companies, they have access to resources. So these guys, the informal firms, they don't have access to resources. So the marginal products are going to be high. Okay, they're, they're start of capital, so the marginal product of capital is high. The marginal product is going to be high in these small informal firms, and in the EDB companies, the marginal product is going to be low. 
Okay, that's what we should observe. Okay, if this story is true. Okay, but now I, I want to just uh, go through a fascinating paper. So here's the, this is the paper by uh, just just to summarize the paper by David McKenzie at the World Bank and Chris w w Woodruff at at, at uh, Oxford now, and this is just a just another paper that basically follows that tries to uh, try to do this. And then, but they were more, a lot more scientific, okay? Instead of just spending billions of dollars on a policy, what they attempted to do was to basically run a randomized control experiment to see what effect making the form formal actually, what effect it has, okay? So what they did is that the idea was that they were gonna go around to companies in Sri Lanka, and they basically ran a lottery, okay? If you ran, win the lottery, they were gonna basically make you formal, go through, they were gonna do the work, do the Enando de Soto work, and basically legally register you for free. And then the companies that didn't win the lottery, that would be the control group, okay? So they went around and, and they offered this deal now the first problem they ran it, 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 they ran it into is that they offered this 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 experiment uh, to the companies that won the lottery, and every single company came back to them and said, "No, we don't want we don't want to do this." That is, you know, so it's almost as if you know they offered uh, you know David and Chris they uh, offered to take these companies over to Nirvana. Uh, and these companies said, no, 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 we don't, we don't want to go there. Um, so if they have no take up, then they have no paper, right? So what these guys did is that they basically went back, they got more funding, and they got, in addition to registering these companies for free, they gave them one month of profits, okay, of for as cash, as an additional incentive. So that they got a 20% take up. That still wasn't large enough that the sample wasn't still uh, it wasn't large enough uh, uh, to 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 uh, uh, to to have to for their estimates to have power they got more money and they came back and they made a better offer they 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 got uh, they offered two months of profits uh, this time they got a 50 percent pick up rate that was enough they ran the experiment and at the end of the day they found nothing okay and I think a lot of this work has this feature, has this feature that despite all the money and all the things that we have put, we have put it, it, uh, it into these programs, nothing has happened, okay? And the question is why, okay? And there's, let me just say, there's a, there's, there's a Mexican guy who used to run the Inter-American Development Bank, this guy called Santiago Levy. And, there, there was also this really nice study of the McKinsey Global Institute in Brazil in which they, they have an answer. The answer that they give is that, no, the way that you want to think about this is completely the other way. That is, what's going on is that, no, 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 it's that the firms that are formal are the companies that get taxed, are the companies that get subject to regulations. Okay, and so therefore, nobody wants to be that. Nobody wants to be a firm that gets taxed. Nobody wants to be a firm that gets subject to regulations. And if you are a small informal firm, you evade taxes. You evade re, You evade the re, You evade the regulations. And that is the basic reason for why you have so many firms that are informal. You have many firms that are in, in, informal because you 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 have a tax system that doesn't enforce taxes on the firms that are small, but it only enforces the, the firms that are big. And I'll give you a story to illustrate this. Maybe about 10 years ago, I spent a day at the tax agency in Mexico, and I was trying to um, understand how the tax authorities allocate their inspectors. I was trying to figure out who they choose to audit, and who they choose to audit and where, what companies do they send their inspectors out to. And at the end of the day, the head of this office was getting really impatient with me. And he said, sir, uh, let me explain in clear terms, what is it that we do? 
Okay, here at the tax agency, we go hunting for animals in the zoo. Think of, think about that phrase. I, 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 it's a phrase that I love. Okay, because to think about what what the what what the head of the office is describing. Okay, hunting means what? Like they are trying to collect revenues. Okay, okay, they have a they have limited resources. So how do they allocate their resources? They go hunting for animals in the zoo. What, what does? What, why would they go hunting for animals in the zoo? Because there the animals are tied down. They're big and they don't run. Okay, so you can get lots of taxes without a whole lot of work. But there are all these small animals out there in the jungle that are running very fast. It takes a lot of work to chase them. And even if you chase them and you catch them, they're small, so you don't get a whole lot of meat. So they don't bother. Right. So it's basically a model of basically limited capacity and uh, of, of, of the limited government capacity and the distortions that come endogenously because of that. Okay. Now, this also seems like a plausible story. Right. Now, l- let's go back and let's try to classify this story into EDB versus non EDB. If you think about the story, which are the EDB firms? Okay. In this case, the companies that are the EDB firms are the companies that are in the jungle. These are the small guys, okay? And the companies that are not the EDB firms that are that, 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 that are you know in the zoo and you know and that are being killed every day, these are the big guys. Okay. So in terms of marginal products, what would you see? Right? It's the big guys, these are the guys that are getting killed, and you would see that the marginal products are big. Okay, and the little guys, you would see that the marginal products are small. They're running around free in the jungle. The tax inspectors is not is is not trying to is not trying is not trying to chase them. And this is you know you know it's this is a, a possible answer for for the results in Sri Lanka that I just described to you. So imagine that somebody comes to you. And you are running around free in the jungle and somebody is co- coming around and saying, let me run this experiment and let me put you in jail, essentially. Okay? Uh, and they, they say, no, 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 why do I want, no, thank you, I don't want to be in jail. Then they come back and, and it's really funny when you, you talk with these guys, like, you know, this program that I'm offering you, it's such an obviously good thing. How could you possibly say no? Uh, and, uh, and, and and without thinking about what else, you know, that maybe it's the case that the underlying assumption that they're going into the study with is just fundamentally wrong, right? So then they go back and they say, okay, you don't want to go to jail. I'm exaggerating. You don't want to jail. What if I give you $10,000? $10,000. Okay, maybe some of them choose to, for $10,000, I'll spend two months in jail. That's a price I'm willing to that's a price that I'm willing to uh, pay. That was not enough. So you up the money and then you get enough, you know, you, we know that if you, for, for people that are poor, if you give them enough money, they will, they will do things, right? They, they, will, they will do things and you can interpret that 50% as being the break-even point, right? As the fraction of, of these small uh, business owners that are, willing, that are willing to be in jail in exchange for the cash that you're going to you give them. Okay, so I want to point out that, that these are basically both are sensible, but they see they are diametrically different stories for this really important fact, right? But this setup gives us a very clear way of trying to figure out which side is right. Okay, this uh, the this this last view that I'm giving you is basically saying that if you look at the small firms, the marginal product is going to be low, okay? The other view, the microfinance and all these guys view, says exactly the opposite, okay? So, and there's something that you can easily test in the data, okay? So let me ask the audience, okay, when you look at the data, I'll show you the data in the next slide, but in the the next slide, and the, the data speaks very clearly, very, very clear, clearly. But which way do you think the which way do you think the data goes? Any brave souls that want to venture a guess?
All right, uh, Michael, you, you're my co-author, so I, 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 I'm going to put the tax on you. <laughs> I'm going to put the tax on you, Michael. What's your guess? <laughs> Why don't you tell us? <laughs> all right, all right. I'll, I'll tell you what the, 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 the data shows. So every country that I've looked at looks like this, okay? So this is from the micro data for three countries, India, Indonesia, and Mexico. So this is from the census of firms in these three countries. The first column is the productivity of capital. The second column is the productivity of labor. And what's on the X axis is a log of employment of the firm. Okay, note that the data speaks very clearly. Okay, it speaks very, very, uh, very, very uh, clearly that the productivity of capital is, is higher for large firms relative to small firms, and the productivity of labor is higher for large firms relative to, to small firms. Okay, the second thing I want you to see is also just the magnitude that the gap in the productivity of labor is much, much larger than the gap in the, pro, in the productivity of capital. And it's the, the gap in the productivity of capital is a bit more nuanced. That is, if you look at, say, India, when you go and look at, say, mid-sized firms versus firms that are the very largest, you know, it looks about roughly constant. It, it's only when you look at the mid-sized firms versus the very smallest firms that the mid-sized firms have a higher uh, average product of capital. When you look at the data for Mexico, you see the same thing. Um, I try really hard to show this, to put together the uh, comparable data for Indonesia. The problem with, with that data is that I think I figured out that's, that the companies respond in different units. Sometimes they respond in millions of uh, rupiah. Sometimes they, they respond in hundreds of thousands and I can't figure out which is which. <laughs> Uh, so that's why I chose not to show it uh, in, in the case of Indonesia. But also, if you look at the gaps, right, the gap between the mid-sized and the and the smallest firms, they differ by you know by 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 about 0.5 to 0.6 log points. Okay, but if you look at compare that to the gap in the in, in the product of labor, right, in the average product of, of labor, the gaps in the average product of labor are huge. They're enormous. Okay. They're enormous. They differ, say, in, in, in India, they differ by 2.5 log points, okay? So it's like, it's like, like a factor of eight, okay? And, it's, and, the, and the gaps are similar, whether you look at India, whether you look at Indonesia, or whether you look at uh, Mexico, okay? Uh, so what this is saying, I think, very clearly is, is that, is that you know, the, these two decades of work that the international community has done to try to solve the problem of informality, they were, we were basically barking up the we were basically barking up the wrong tree. That we had in mind what what ex ante was a sensible story, right? But nobody thought to test that story against the data. You know, it was just based on some anecdotes, Hernando Hernando de Air, uh, you know, Hernando de Soto stories about lack of access to credit, but without any systematic testing of data or just thinking about what are the logical implications of that view. And then you, you, you the, the, the end result is that, you know, you end up with the, 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 uh, the McKenzie Woodruff, uh, the McKenzie, uh, the McKenzie Woodruff results. And also just billions of dollars spent on something that, you know, doesn't go, that doesn't go anywhere. Um, can, I, can I ask a question? Sometimes? Of course. Yeah. So here, the data you have, uh, since it's, I'm guessing that this is coming from some government source. And so these are actually all formal firms, right? No. Because, oh, okay. It's, yeah. It's, it's. It, yeah, it's coming from it's coming from the government. It's 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 coming from the government, but uh, it, importantly, the data includes all it includes all the firms that are informal. Okay. Um, in the case of Indonesia, it's the census which is captures uh, both the ones that are informal. In the case of Mexico, in India, it's actually two it's actually two 
data sets. They spread the data. There's a survey on census of firms that are formal, and there's a, another census of firms that are informal. Okay, and, and what I'm showing you here is, is both, both, both sources of data put together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know whenever you look at a country like India or Indonesia or Mexico, you really have to look at the in and have to look at the informal guys. Uh, because if you don't, then you're missing where all we're missing where all of the action is. So Chantai, yeah. Sorry for coming back to kind of markup discussion. So a typical way to to interpret these uh, figures is that you know larger firms tend to have uh, larger markups. Yeah. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, you could, you could. I, I guess my only, uh, I, I think that's that has to be there in the data that 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 is behind some of this. But then to explain uh, a difference of two point five log points, uh, that uh, that 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 seems crazy. I I I I cannot. I mean that that would apply huge. I mean, you one could write a paper about how there's a lot more markup dispersion in India and. Indonesia, right, and and using this as as the basis, but I wouldn't believe it because it's just yes, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. I I I have trouble with the uh, McKenzie and Woodruff study. I, I, I'm first of all, I I worry a lot that natural experiments are are being way overdone. So in this case, suppose I took in the U.S. Uh, a bunch of suppose that you couldn't get capital easily in the U.S. And I just sprinkled capital on 30 or so small firms with four workers. And suppose one of them is a pizza parlor I used to go to near Harvard. And another one is Bill Gates and his friends in a hotel room in New Mexico. I think it was New Mexico, right? I mean, the thing is that the, the small firms that take off and that become big are very small tail events. And it's very unlikely that when Woodruff and McKenzie did their thing, they got a Bill Gates in their sample. They probably mostly got people who were running roadside tea stands and stuff where the advantage of being formal really isn't there. But in that country, if Bill Gates runs up against those problems or a Peruvian Bill Gates, he moves to the United States. He doesn't do his innovation in Peru. And isn't that the problem there? there, there there's a, a tale of small firms that become big firms. And even in the US, most small firms don't become big. That's one, yeah, so. Um, so I don't see that that paper has anything to do with this problem. And the second thing is that I, I, I think the, you're right to dump on, on, on the money that was put into into these things uh, because the, the, the delays and, and costs of registering a business are only one very small barrier to entry that's designed to keep the oligarchs in these countries in charge. There, there, there are lots and lots of others. And so you've got to deal with all of them, not, not just the one. Yeah, so I, I, let me just take what you're saying. And I say, you were saying is that a richer model is not really that all the discussion about informality is missing where all of the action is. Like it's not about this mass of small firms that right. maybe I, 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 I'm, I'm gonna put some words in your mouth that you uh -huh. didn't quite say, but I could push uh -huh. you to say that, look, you know, the problem is not about this mass of small firms. That is, it could very well be the case that in an efficient, well-functioning economy, most of these small firms should die. Uh, well, should die. Or just, or just, just remain small uh, there. The pizza the problem is that somewhere in the haystack, right? There's a needle. Uh, there, 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 there's a needle that doesn't that that uh, doesn't have the chance to show up. That right. Is, that's, you don't see blackberries and Microsoft rising right, in Peru. Right. Right. So uh, uh, that would be a great paper to write, right? Uh, that the, the, the uh, that it's that the problem is not about all these small firms. That it's something about the nature of selection, right? Okay. But then that calls for a different type of intervention, right? Well, it, 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 doesn't it call for removing the barriers to all firms because the government isn't going to be able to pick Microsoft as the one that should be allowed to expand? Yeah. If you get yeah. rid of the barriers for all firms, then the natural expansion can happen. Right. 
it's, it's about, then the question is, you know, what are exactly are the institutions that allow for the flow of information and that allows for the flow of resources once you, so you've got to first find that needle and then you've got to allocate the capital and the labor and all the, re, all the resources to that needle. Yeah, and, and we, we, we can do that in, in, in most OECD countries. We, we use capital markets. Yeah, so then, the, then the answer would be that that is the particular feature of capital markets that one should be focusing their... their well, uh, but, but there's lots, lots of others too, though. I mean, right, that... Right, right, right. <laughs> Absolutely. About, let, let, let me just... I, I, I want to show you just uh, something interesting that has happened in... Uh, something uh, interesting that has happened in, uh, in India that has relax this constraint. And let me just go to the point about the large gaps in, in the marginal product of labor that you see between large and small Indian firms. And one thing that could be going on, and this is a story that you hear a lot in India, is that there's this thing, there, 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 that, that there, there was a law that was placed in 1947 called the Industrial Disputes Act. And it basically was basically put in place when the British were leaving and a lot of the British companies were leaving. So the new Indian government, they put in place this law that basically said that you cannot let, let your workers go because of the dislocation that that causes. But they put in you know, this loophole because most of the companies were small. And if they enforced it, that this, this the industrial, the industrial disuse, like a lot of companies would just go bankrupt. So they put in a loophole to this law that says that, okay, we're only going to enforce this law for, for firms that hire more than 100 workers. And then the ones that are smaller, you can do whatever you want. So this is a one particular example of what might be behind that gap, right? Uh, the gap that basically, if you are a large firm, and uh, what's what's going to happen? You know, you you uh, get a new order. You need to uh, increase the size of your firm. But then you worry about you know what's going to happen in five years when these orders go away. So that you are going to be very very careful. You're going to be very very uh, careful. You are going to try to squeeze as much you can out of these workers. So one so so the consequence of that is exactly what you're seeing in the data that the marginal product of labor in the large firms is low because they're they are very very cautious uh, when when they get positive shocks and that's not true when you're looking at the when you're looking at at the small firms okay what this i want to show you this is a quick yeah. di uh, historical dig digression on history who really set up this this law that make it very costly to be uh, to be large. The, the is it the, the the Indian government or was it set up by the colonial government before they left? It's the new, yeah, it's the new Indian government, and what they were trying to target were what they were trying to target were these uh, British firms. Uh, yeah, because I'm curious because I know that in Hong Kong, before the in the in the negotiation of the of the take of the turnover, there is a stipulation that the old government employees cannot be fired and they would enjoy a, a constant raise in salary and also promotions and this kind of stuff. I'm just curious. Um, I don't know enough about Indian history to know whether something equivalent happened to the Indian civil service. So I, I don't know. Uh, but let me go on and say that what has been really fascinating to see in, uh, in, in India are two things. One is that there has been no change in the Industrial Disputes Act. So this is the one law on the books in India that has not changed at all. Most of the, the reforms that took place in, in, in India were these things called the licensing laws. And most of these things were gone by the mid 1990s. And these licensing laws were, were basically in order, if you want to expand to a new product, you needed to get the relevant license from the central bureaucracy of the Indian government. Most of these things went away by the mid 19, uh, by the mid by the mid 1990, by the mid 1990s. Okay, and then what you see is that the one consequence of the the licensing was that companies that had the ability that had that had the ability 
to expand into new markets, expand in, into new products. These were the companies that benefited the most from Indian reforms, from the dismantling of the licensing laws. But now what I want you to think of is if you see de-licensing coupled with this Industrial Disputes Act that doesn't change, what's going to be the consequence? It's almost as if an easy way to think about it is that suppose that you have the large firms, the high, the high A firms, as a consequence of the de-licensing, of the licensing, it's like a, a simple reduced one way of thinking about it is that suppose they're A group, okay? So suppose that you have an increase in A, okay? okay? In, in an efficient equilibrium, when you have an increase in A, when you expand your markets and you expand the products you make, you're going to grow and you're, you are going to uh, use more resources, okay? But this is India, and you still have the Industrial Disputes Act on the book, okay? So what's going to happen there, just to get you to think through it logically, is that the Industrial Disputes Act, this, this, the, the, this thing, is going to become even more binding, okay? It's going to, that, that is, if your TFP, uh, if, your T, if your A has gone up by a lot, but this thing, which may not be as constraining in the past when you couldn't, when you were not allowed to expand, once you're allowed to expand, this thing really, really bites. Okay. So what you're going to see is that what, the, what logically what you're going to see is that de-licensing is going to be coupled with an increase in the, in the gap in the marginal product of labor between the large firms and the, the large firms and, uh, and, and the small firms. And let me just show you that this is exactly what you see, okay? It's exactly what you see in India. So what, what this is, what I'm telling you is basically what just uh, 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 estimates from the micro data. And what I'm showing you is basically the elasticity of the average product of labor with respect to the size of the firm. And what you see in the late 1980s and throughout the, 19, the 90s is that this elasticity is rising. Okay, that is the gap in the average product of labor in labor productivity between the large Indian firms and the small Indian firms is rising. Okay, in this case, it's being driven by higher A. Okay, it's this it's de licensing that is causing this. Okay, but it's not just de licensing; it's de licensing coupled with the industrial dispute stack, such that you are not expanding your employment as much as you ideally would like to, to grow. So basically, this is productivity growth in India, but it's constrained productivity growth, okay? It's almost as if, you know, you finally allow uh, Steve Jobs to come up with a new product, but you don't allow him to grow out of his parents' garage. That's, you know, that's that, uh, Okay. But the second thing I want you to see is that look what happened starting in about 2000. You see this gap falling. Okay. This elasticity is falling. Okay. And to just show, but uh, to, so, uh, so, and what would you, what, what does this suggest is going on? This is exactly what you would expect to see if the Industrial Disputes Act is no longer as binding. Okay, that is the constraint on labor, on, on uh, labor. And let me just show you that this is only something specific to labor. You don't see this in terms of capital. That is, you see the, this is the same thing, but about the uh, average product of capital. And what you see is that um, the elasticity of capital, capital productivity with respect to size is falling. Because the other thing that was happening was... Uh, was the uh, liberalization of the capital markets, and they naturally went to these firms that were the most affected by the the most affected by the licensing. Okay, so what, what I want you to get from this is that you know something is happening that is right that is leading to the rise of the labor pro the labor productivity of, of the largest Indian firms throughout the 1990s, and something is happening so such that it's falling. Okay, and what I'm suggesting to you is that the story is that what's happening in the 1990s is that it's basically an increase in the TFP of the largest Indian firms, okay, coupled with the labor constraint that is more and more binding. And what looks like what happened in after 2000 is that this labor constraint is now less binding. Okay, so again, we should be careful. I'll just say it again now for the 10th time 
that this declining labor problem, declining the declining elasticity does not tell you. It's not evidence that, that the large Indian firms are now are that the TFP is falling. It's just saying that the marginal product is falling. Okay, which is the natural consequence if they now can hire. Okay, but. I want to then tell you that nothing happened to the industrial, nothing at all happened to the industrial disputes act. So the puzzle is how can it be the case that nothing has happened to the industrial disputes act? Yet it looks like the industrial, the industrial dispute act has gone. And this is what got us started in this. And I want to tell you about this company. What's going on is that there's a, there, there's in the last 20 or so years, there's a brand new industry in, uh, in, in, uh, in India. And it, it's basically companies like this. So this is the company that we've been doing, we'll work with. Here's a, it's a company called Team Lease. It was founded in 1997 by this Indian guy who basically has spent uh, 10 years before that uh, working in Singapore. Uh, and then he went back home and he created this company called Team Lease. And the, the way that he tells the, the, he tells the story is that 1997, he looked around and he, he realized that the main constraint that a lot of Indian companies were facing was about, was, was about labor, okay? Uh, that is, and it's a natural, so that he thought about this, 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 this model and the model was, is this company that is now a pretty large company. So what, what does this company do? Right? The company now has 99,000 workers, administrative staff of, of about 1,000. And what the company does, its business model is entirely, it basically supplies workers to these large Indian companies. So they have about 1,000 clients, mostly in the service sector. They're about 83 workers per client. Okay. And typically, the workers are hired with a one-year contract. But the key thing that Team Lease gives them is that with the one that if the, 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 the their clients with a one month notice, they can send these workers back to team lease. Okay, so team lease obviously hires more than hundred people, so it it's subject to the Industrial Disputes Act, so it cannot let any of these workers go. Okay, it pays. Uh, payroll taxes. It's a company based in Mumbai, eight branches throughout the, throughout the country. But the main thing that it gives them is basically this flexibility. Okay, it it it, it gives work. It gives these companies that are subject to the industrial the, to the industrial disputes act. There's, so there are now about thirty companies with about the same size as uh, as as the. Uh, 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 a team. So the consequence of this is that it's companies like this that has been responsible for the this this decline in the elasticity of labor prod labor productivity with respect uh, to the size of the firm. Okay, so what do they do? Who are their clients? It's basically companies that are subject to the are subject to the Industrial Disputes Act. So what's happened over time, this is a plot of the firm size distribution and you see a slight shift towards the right. So there's, uh, and what you see is that, uh, so here's just some more summary statistical data. The share of plants with more than hundred workers, it goes from 11% to about 15%. So relative to China, this is nothing, uh, this is nothing, but for a place like India where nothing happens for a long, long time, you know, this is a momentous change, right? And, and so here's some just basic facts. Uh, this is basically the share of its two numbers. So the, uh, the blue line is the share of large firms that use contract workers that goes up from about 30% to about 60% by 2010. The red line is conditional on hiring contract workers. What fraction of the labor force are contract workers? And that goes up from 40 to 60%. So by 2010, about of the large Indian companies, you have uh, 60 times 60. So that's 36% of the workers are being basically outsourced right through 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 this through through uh through through these uh uh, uh companies so uh, 
So we, we don't have much time left, but still, I, I want to ask a question about the, uh, this kind of uh, arrangements. So if I understand correctly, so why don't we see this type of business, uh, you know, before the deregulation? It seems to me, you know, uh, this business model should be actually more popular when uh, the regulation was still there, right? I, I mean, the way that these guys tell the story is that there were two regulate, two main regulations that were on the books. It's it's the Industrial Disputes Act, which is about which is it's about it's 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 that's regulating employment, and there was the regulation on the product market on the on the product market. Um, and the way that these guys tell the story is that there was there was no demand for doing something like this before. Because the very few Indian companies were big, and very few Indian companies wanted to hire, uh, and it was only when when these 1991 reforms were put in place, and you remove the restrictions on the output market, uh, on the uh, on the output market, that's when this constraint started to become really binding. Um, uh, it, it, so it's almost like the message that I got from from the, the, the when, when I was in Singapore two years ago that these guys were basically getting killed. The the the, the uh, Singaporean company. So I'm interested in Bernie's take on this. They were feeling that they were getting killed by 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 these uh, labor laws by by these. Uh, uh, Singaporean and uh, and the foreign will work and foreign will workers law. Now nobody thought about a way of, of trying to solve this except to go banging on the doors of the EDB. Uh, but there, you know, I, I, I guess I, I, I'm not saying. Yeah, in Singapore, this would not be possible because because well, what is this, right? This is basically and this is basically a, a way to try to to try to skirt the law. Right to 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 skirt the law, um, but in a sense, you know, Michael, this is what I think of as being like a small scale version of, of of our story for China. That's all about ways of trying to of trying to skirt the formal system. Uh, yeah. And so, but this is just that on uh, this is just the China story on a very tiny scale, right? Uh, uh, so, Chante, I do want to uh, spend like one or two minutes to wrap up. I, yeah, I guess no. Let, let me just let you, uh, the the uh, participants, speak or ask questions. I mean, I, there were, you know, I had uh, another hour prepared, but these always take more time. <laughs> okay. Uh, but since we're talking about it, I'm I'm interested in the take of the of people in Singapore to to what I suggested of what of what what seems to me to be one of the major sources of misallocation in Singapore. Uh, Bernie, do you want to say something on that? I, I'm thinking about it. Um, I, um, there, there exist constraints. Um, I really do not know enough because what we are talking at a lot of the constraints that we face, uh, if I may, I'm just guessing. Uh, based on the smaller companies, and um, yeah. we're talking about the, the the quota, right? A constraint by the labor company, um, and at the same, uh, uh, um, they're constrained by the smaller company. But I am not familiar enough with them uh, to find out what they do. I know that they they do have the the complaint, and they do. I think thing, thing of my impression, and I emphasize that impression, is that the government is rational and flexible in approaching this problem. So it's not like the case that it is uh, so rigid that you cannot deal with uh, the situation. That's what, that's what I would say. Um, the, not just the, the large company with the EDB, even the smaller ones, they may find some solution, as long as it's a reasonable solution. So it's a balance between two things, the local constituents' concern and then all the business uh, strive for, for doing better. 
uh, but th this is really a very soft answer. I do not have data. I have not talked to those people. Um, and uh, the version of the story I get always is um, is quite uh, flexible and quite reasonable. But I do not know if there's any bias in my sampling. Yeah. But then what's the source of the flexibility for the small companies? Who do they turn to? That, that part I do not know. Uh, I I um, I really don't know. Okay. So one one thing I would like to add is uh, you know from China's experience, um, if it, I'm I'm pretty sure you you have seen that uh, Chang Tai. So if you if you look at manufacturing firm data in in China, you see the same upward sloping uh, you know labor productivity size profile. But you see the opposite when it comes to uh, capital productivity. So that's very different from uh, you know uh, the results you show. So one way to interpret is uh, the Chinese government that actually is uh, helping you know those large firms uh, in the capital market. So that's something that you you don't see in those uh, developing economies. So you just uh, uh, documented. So, so that's one, one thing. I, I found that it's actually quite interesting. By, by the way, uh, sorry, Michael. Uh, I, I, um, uh, and uh, sorry to go back, back, back track, but I, a very important point I think is worth raising. The public policy in the Singapore setting um, is that it, it does, is thinking about what the future is like. And so the government is consciously trying to develop a policy to push companies' investment in productivity. And that includes you restricting your supply labor pool so that you will invest in technology. So we see a lot of the, the restaurants now are using robots or, or the, the iPad and all these things to, to do so. And also improving in the cash collection, the cash registers, and so on. So, in in a way, the Singapore story is uh, uh, is a bit more than just about protecting the local workers. But there is some uh, there's a purpose here in pushing, and the government gives subsidies to companies to push them to invest in future technology and raise the overall productivity. Right. Uh, let me. Uh, I want to. Uh, let me, I'll just add to that is that I think what we don't know, what, what we don't know is basically whether that actually works or whether it is just resulting in more resource misallocation. There, uh, there seems to be, there uh, seems to be some work uh, that is positive. Uh, the overall resource allocation, I do not know. But I know that at the micro level, like people like Ivan Pan, uh, he has done work on to show that using the technology seems to, to be helpful to the employed workers, uh, not in terms of salaries and so on, but uh, it's just there's some positive results in raise, no, actually no, raising yeah. productivity. Yeah, what I mean is, oh, I mean, that, that I believe, I guess what I mean is, is like the first part of what you said is in terms of, say, the consequences of what I might of what I, I see as my little bit of institutional knowledge of Singapore, I, I see the two major bodies are the EDB and uh, and the, what's that thing called the the Jurong Corporation, the one that allocates land, right? The, the, these are the two main pieces. Whether that has led to the kind of technological transformation that you suggested, or whether it's just led to more misallocation, I, I don't. There is also like we have to. Uh, I, I want to. I want you to, to. I interrupt you because there's yeah. in your work. There's one more thing about the productivity within the company. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I think the, the to push to push people to think about how to raise the uh, the resource allocations and so on. It. it um, I would be thinking about the kind of work by Nick Bloom and so on. That when you push hard, you find out that when you uh, when you do all this. Uh, this and that little things you can raise the workers' productivity. Just tidying up the workshop is sure, an example. Sure, sure, and sure. so my personal experience is this. Before the before all this uh, the law, I hire someone um, to do to redo my by, by the way, I, 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 I th for the audience that uh, you know, if you are, if you have time, you have to go to other things. I think uh, allow us to carry on with this, with this conversation, but feel free to to pursue what your what your schedule is. 
My personal experience is this. I hire someone to do renovation in my shop, in my home. It's really interesting because it involves the, the floor, the wall, and the ceiling. And I don't know why. You know, they, they would do the floor first, then they do the wall. Then they dirty up the, the floor. They have to redo the, wall, the, the floor. And then, then they do the ceiling. And this time, they dirty up the wall and the floor. So they did the same thing again and again and again. And it's just totally, utterly inefficient. And, and then I noticed that a lot of these workers are, are not trained. They are, uh, they are, uh, uh, they are um, uh, 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 migrant workers, so as to speak. So I keep on asking the, the question that why don't they listen to Nick Bloom? You know, remember his work about just raising the productivity, uh, just a bit, of, a bit of a consulting surface and so on. So in, in a way, I become sympathetic to the argument of putting in the constraint to push company to search for ways to raise your productivity. Right. And then I would say that the question is whether it's what's the best way to do that, whether it's a competitive of the right. market or w whether it's basically handing out incentives and subsidies right, right. To, to, right. to to do it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'm, think, I'm also thinking about like um, the, the graph that we see right now is, is quite, quite. And then the, the question that Michael raised it. When you when you re relax the constraint a little bit on that market, it it incentivizes the shop owners to think about how uh, whether it's worth the while to expand. It it raises their it mutes their resistance to expand, and therefore the consulting service become more uh, the demand for the consulting service go up. So it is yeah. back to your point, Ching Tai, how we really motivate people to push their productivity. And uh, not just the existing shops, but the future shops. You know, it's very interesting to watch because I, if you want to, my, 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 this is my own idiosyncratic view of Singapore is that I think that Singapore is basically at this crossroads where, um, like, if you look empirically at the data, uh, like their biggest source of, of, of growth is for a long time, it's basically been uh, inflows of workers from the rest of the world. Uh, just, I mean, it's, it, it's been a huge, that, uh, that, so that, that's been, and, and then that all basically came to a halt in 2014, right, as, as a result of the elections that took place that year. And it was then that these quotas were put in place. And then it's been really interesting to watch that, that, it's, it's been this search for something else. And they've settled on like, you know, what we're gonna do is that we are gonna, whatever, you know, there's this policy call, there's the model for the new Singapore uh, and, uh, and uh, innovation. And it'd be really fascinating to see whether any of that works. Thanks a lot, you know, Chantai, once again, for this wonderful, inspiring uh, talk. Due to time constraint, you know, let's, uh, Let's end this uh, this master uh, lecture, and uh, I would like to also, you know, uh, thank uh, Bernard and uh, uh, his colleagues at uh, uh, ABF ER to uh, provide us this wonderful opportunity. Look forward to more of this kind of uh, things in the future. Thanks, okay. Bernie.